Welcome to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. I'm Tony Guerra, the pharmacist and author of the Memorizing Pharmacology book series, bringing you mnemonics, cases, and advice for succeeding in pharmacology. Sign up for the email list at memorizingpharm.com to get your free suffixes cheat sheet or find our mobile-friendly, self-paced online pharmacology review course at residency.teachable.com forward slash p forward slash mobile. Let's get started with the show. Okay, today we're going to go over diuretic pharmacology mnemonics, and where we're going to start actually is just a little brief review of you know, what happens with urine formation, and there are four words you really need to know. So filtration happens at the glomerulus, and glomerulus just means like bundle of string, because it's all kind of convoluted. Uh, reabsorption, which happens at the renal tubules, so to the paratubular or renal capillaries. So when you're looking at reabsorption, okay, what's happening is that you are getting it to come back. Okay, so you're getting that uh, fluid, whatever it is, uh, to resorb um, into uh, the capillaries. Whereas secretion is the opposite. So you can kind of see the arrows here where uh, secretion is the paratubular or renal capillaries going into the collecting duct, which will eventually result in number four, which is excretion from the body. But this should look weird to you. At some point in your anatomy class, you learn that an artery went to a little arteriole, which went to a smaller capillary, which went to a little venule, which went to veins. But Bowman's capsule actually has an efferent and afferent arteriole. So it goes arteriole, capillary, arteriole. What that does is it creates a really high pressure system, much like a garden hose. And the way we're going to learn this, because that pressure is so high at the one part, that means the pressure at the end of that hose is much lower. So I don't know if you remember from... Uh, if you're in the United States, uh, you learn the United States generally in four regions. You learn the West, and maybe you broke that up into Southwest and West, uh, then the Midwest, uh, then Southeast, and then the Northeast. So we're going to do the same thing here because those regions are different when we talk about the nephron. So our Western region is going to be the proximal convoluted tubule. So proximal just means close to something. So I'm in close proximity to you. So proximal to the glomerulus and that really high pressure system. That's going to be one, the carbonic and hydrase inhibitors like acetazolamide, and, which is diamox, and two, the osmotic diuretic, so mannitol, which is osmetrol. Then we're going to kind of go to the Midwest where we're going to see the ascending loop of Henle. Uh, or the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. And that's our loop diuretics. Now, the big thing here is going to be hypokalemia, and we'll talk about how we deal with that in a later slide. But this is furosemide, which is Lasix, torsemide, demodex, and bumetanide, which is bumex. And then we move on to what would probably be the northeast, which is the distal convoluted tubule. And really, <clears throat> the early part of the distal convoluted tubule. So the thiazides will also cause hypokalemia. So this Midwest and Northeast, this kind of middle of the nephron uh, is causing hypokalemia. And this is gonna be important because later we're gonna see the opposite. And this is hydrochlorothiazide, which is diazide, if you combine it uh, with triamterine, and then chlorothalidone, which is thalatone, though probably couldn't find the brand name if we wanted to. Uh, and then the last one is the DCT, or collecting duct. So these are number five, which is the potassium sparing group. Okay, so again, this is at the DCT, right at the collecting duct. So towards the end of that distal convoluted tubule, and we have hyperkalemia. So later on, we'll see that we can pair these together. And... I've seen a couple mnemonics for this, but I like mine better. Uh, I like to use spare for sparing. So spironolactone, we'll use the SP, which is aldactone. Uh, amyloride, which is mitomore. Triamterine, we have to take the R, which is the second letter. It's 
not ideal, but again, I think Spare is a better mnemonic uh, for Direnium, and then Eplerinone, which is Inspira. And Eplerinone and Spironolactone work the same way, Amyloride and Tramterine work the same way, and we'll see that later. All right, I always feel like I'm defending mnemonics against those who say that you're not understanding it, you're just memorizing it, and you wanna, you know, you really wanna understand it. Well, I'm not saying don't understand it. I think that it's a lot easier to understand things if I have the desk on the right than the desk on the left. So with mnemonics, I'm just trying to make it so that you're not cluttered, so that you can kind of clearly understand a concept, move on to the next. So to me, pharmacology without mnemonics is the desk with all that junk on it, and pharmacology with mnemonics is the nice, clean uh, desk on the right. So our mnemonic that we use to, uh, as we kind of go through these medications, and we'll look at some other pieces of it that can help us as well, but I am a considerate health professional, and that considerate is really for considerations and contraindications, but being empathetic to what it is that the patient has right now, and you can see what I'm doing there, getting our ducks in a row. All right, we'll put our generic name, then brand name uh, first, any stems, we'll try to underline those. And then again, I is for indication, M for mechanism of action, which again, you can just say the drug class. So what is the mechanism of action of acetazolamide? Well, you can just say it is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, okay? That is the mechanism of action. Now, your instructor probably wants it is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor that does blank. That's probably what they want. Adverse effects are the A, considerations are the C, and then how can we help the patient uh, best take their medication is H. So let's move first to acetazolamide, which is Diamox. Uh, it is for intracranial hypertension, intraocular pressure, hopefully those two intras uh, help you remember it, and then also altitude sickness. So I have a home in Arizona and Although I probably can't afford Flagstaff now, the, the way that things have gone up, but I think of Arizonamide instead of Acetazolamide. So this is actually a picture of Humphreys Peak, which is the tallest mountain in Arizona. And you would get altitude sickness uh, if you went uh, all the way up there. So I also changed Arizonamide instead of the amide, A-M-I-D-E to M-E-Y-E-D, uh, because of that intraocular pressure and then the M for mountain. So I got it all in there. The, and here's the last piece of this mnemonic, just from this picture. Uh, the mechanism of action is that it is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, which means that we retain carbonic acid. Since there is a road, there would probably be a car on there. All right see what I did there. All right, and so what we're going to have is, this kind of leads to our adverse effect, metabolic acidosis because of that carbonic acid that we're retaining. So what are our considerations? Well, we wanna watch out for that acid-base imbalance and uh, really uh, renal disease would be a real problem uh, with using acetazolamide. And you know, how can we help them take it? We want to make sure we have labs on them. Uh, and then watching that intraocular pressure uh, as well. Okay. All right, let's go on to our next one. Again, we're still in that uh, west coast. We're still at that proximal convoluted tubule, proximal to the glomerulus with mannitol, which is osmotrol. And the nice thing about that and acetazolamide is that it really, it's very similar indications, intracranial hypertension, intraocular pressure. Uh, it's an osmotic. You might recognize mannitol from sorbitol. They look really same. They're sugar alcohols. Uh, they look really similar. Okay. And the big issue, though, are going to be those electrolyte imbalances. And then because it creates so much diuresis, uh, we could become hypovolemic. That is too little uh, volume. Uh, so our contraindications, anytime we have electrolyte imbalances, generally something like congestive heart failure is a real concern. And then dehydration, certainly, if we're going to have too little volume. And we're going to use our labs uh, as our way of uh, making sure that things are on the up and up. Uh, so I just have a collision here, a man who has the head trauma 
or intracranial issue. Uh, and so if you want to, you can look at the NIT in Manitol, mix the letters around to make INT to remind you that it is intracranial and intraocular pressure. Uh, furosemide or Lasix, uh, pee furiously, because this creates also a lot of diuresis, but certainly not as much as mannitol, but more than hydrochlorothiazide. And so we've moved from the West Coast to the Midwest. Okay, so the Midwest has a couple of different issues uh, with it. I live in the Midwest, but I'm talking about in terms of our uh, mnemonic here. So indications. Notice that we would use this for CHF as opposed to something like hydrochlorothiazide, which doesn't produce an, as much diuresis, which would be for hypertension, a lesser condition. So CHF, edema, that's certainly why we would use furosemide. Uh, it blocks sodium and water resorption in the ascending loop of Henle. So again, that's kind of our Midwest portion. And so because of that, we're going to get hyponatremia, that is we lose that sodium, and also hypokalemia. Uh, and that is that middle section where both the ascending loop of Henle drugs and that distal convoluted tubule, which we'll talk about in a second, both of those guys are hypokalemia. We'll get to the uh, southeastern section where we uh, will talk about hyperkalemia. Okay, so when you take away that much fluid though, it's likely you could get orthostatic hypotension. Now, the ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity are part of furosemide, but it's a little bit tough. It's like, how do you remember that uh, those are, are part of it? And so I, I've got a picture of tinnitus here, or tinnitus as some people say it, uh, and that's that kind of ringing in the ears, the buzzing. For some people it's a roaring or a clicking or a hissing or a humming, uh, but uh, this is that um, damaged nerve cell that's uh, causing this uh, really, um, you know, just uncomfortable ringing in the ears. Okay, so ototoxicity, and that's how it would probably present. Um, and then so, you know, what, what considerations we have? Well, we don't want to give something that causes hyponatremia to somebody who is hyponatremic already or hypokalemic already. Uh, and then certainly with renal disease, if we're going to have these kinds of electrolyte imbalances, uh, we really want to be careful there. Uh, so what do we do? Well, we make sure the labs are, uh, again, where we want to see them. Uh, and then be really careful with ototoxic drugs, nephrotoxic drugs, uh, because we don't want to have an additive effect. All right, hydrochlorothiazide. So again, the big contrast here as we move from that Midwest to the Northeast here is that we're treating hypertension level issues rather than CHF level. So um, this is really first thing, first line uh, against uh, hypertension. And then edema, uh, certainly. So the mechanism, uh, now we are blocking sodium and water resorption, but because we're further away from that efferent and afferent arteriole, when we block that sodium and water resorption, we're, we're not doing as much, or we're not causing as much diuresis because we're further away to the right. Okay? And again, distal is the opposite of proximal. So proximal is close to something. Distal is distant from it. So the adverse effect is hypokalemia but also hyperuricemia. So we're still in that hypokalemia zone in the middle, but the hyperuricemia means I increase uric acid. Uric acid is bad for what condition? Yeah, gout, exactly. Um, there's some misunderstanding as to what sulfa allergy really means. When you talk about sulfa, and uh, it's because many people that are talking about sulfa haven't taken organic chemistry and certainly not taught it. But sulfa is talking about this group here where you have an R group. And so it doesn't really matter what's going on to the left of this S here. But these two oxygens bonded to the S in this way or the sulfur in this way also bonded to a nitrogen which also has two R groups, which happen to be hydrogens in this case. But you notice hydrochlorothiazide 
and furosemide both have this <clears throat> sulfa group. And if you were to look at acetazolamide, you'd see the same thing. So unfortunately, you can't generally see the, the chemical formula in this way, but if you could, you could very easily say, okay, that's a sulfa drug, right? So the reason I point this out is that you will notice that acetazolamide, furosemide, and hydrochlorothiazide, none of them have the word sulfa in it, okay? Like sulfa methoxazole, an antibiotic you learn about. So just because it doesn't have sulfa doesn't mean it can't be a sulfa drug. Sulfa is pointing to this moiety, uh, which is on uh, the organic chemistry group. Uh, and then so, again, it's the labs that we really want to watch out for that, that hypokalemia, hyperuricemia. All right, so here's the mnemonic for the potassium sparing, and I just put these all together. Uh, spironolactone, because it does block aldosterone, uh, you will see something like gynecomastia. But what I really want to kind of take away from this section is that we like to pair these potassium sparing drugs with the hypokalemic drugs. So again, those hypokalemic drugs were furosemide, Okay, so spironolactone, which blocks aldosterone, would pair with furosemide. And so would eplerinone, uh, which also blocks aldosterone, and that pairs with furosemide. How does spironolactone work? Well, I'll, you just think about what aldosterone does. So aldosterone holds on to salt, or sodium chloride, or sodium and water to increase our blood pressure when our blood pressure goes too low. So if we're going to block that, okay, we're going to block it, now we're going to lose sodium. Okay, and now we're going to lose water. But because we are so far away from that glomerulus, that high pressure system, the amount of diuresis is very low. So the actual purpose of these drugs is generally to maintain potassium homeostasis or to make sure that the hypokalemia gets X'd out by this hyperkalemia. So when you talk about what are the side effects of a potassium sparing diuretic, well, hyperkalemia uh, would be the, the one that comes to mind. So again, the spared mnemonic is SP for spironolactone, A for amyloride, R for triamterene, and E for aplerinone. The spironolactone and aplerinone both go with furosemide. The amyloride and triamterene pair so well with hydrochlorothiazide that there are actually medications that have them paired together. So amyloride with hydrochlorothiazide becomes modiuretic, and triamterene with hydrochlorothiazide becomes diazide. Last point I want to make is about potassium supplementation itself. So I just got two pictures here. IV bag, potassium, slow sign on the curve. So I remember going up the mountains, you know, in Colorado as we were kind of going up to Pikes Peak. And I assure you, it is terrifying if you're the driver and you go very slow. So potassium supplementation, go very slow. Uh, don't even think about doing something like crushing tablets or something like that uh, to make things you know go faster. Everything must be very slow uh, when you go with potassium supplementation. All right. As always, this informi information is provided to you for informational purposes only, not intended to provide, and should not be relied upon for medical or other advice. If you've got a medical condition, talk to a medical professional. Thanks for listening to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. You can find episodes, cheat sheets, and more at memorizingpharm.com. Again, you can sign up for the email list at memorizingpharm.com to get your free suffixes cheat sheet or find our mobile-friendly, self-paced online pharmacology review course at residency.teachable.com forward slash p forward slash mobile. Thanks again for listening.